On today's show, the story of an awfully goofy goose. Get ready to meet peeps. We head to the spring woods to discover the sweet tradition of making maple syrup. Welcome to the Sugar Shack. I'm so excited to try this today. And we take a walk in the park. This is a hidden gem way up on the tip of Minnesota's Arrowhead. Minnesota Bound, presented by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Hi everybody, Bill and I welcome you to Minnesota Bound. Up first today, Ron Shera introduces you to a most unique family friend. It's the story of Peeps, the Goofy Goose. About the Canada Goose, poet Bell Schmidt once wrote, there is no traffic jam in the sky when you spread your wings and fly. To fly with what? To wing it alongside an ATV? And when your wings get tired, you hitch a ride home? We'll give him a quick water break. It's time to meet Peeps, a Canada goose that goes where, well, few geese have gone. This mother goose story, or maybe a gander goose story, begins with, of all things, a COVID quarantine. I had geese since I was a little kid. The quarantine came along, and I thought back to my boyhood, I was the only boy, and my son is the only boy, and I thought the goose might help, and he lived in the house. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a surprise. He came home and said, hey, honey, we got a goose today, and we started raising him. It's pretty cute. <laughs> um, I like to kind of run around with him. Or float around. I go on the paddle board and he just swims right alongside it. And then when we get up to shore, he decides to get on the paddle board. <laughs> to be clear, Peeps is a domestic <laughs> goose, not a wild Canada goose. But Peeps is truly a member of the family flock since the gosling arrived as a three-day-old. I'm working from home and so I would look out in the mornings and he would always take the dog on a walk down the driveway and pretty soon the goose started joining them. So it's two dogs and the husband and a goose running down the driveway. <laughs> yeah, he's half human at least. <laughs> he thinks he's a human or we're his flock, not really sure. For sure, Peeps is right at home, hanging out on the patio. Landon has his own way of goose calling. Yeah, if you want to have a conversation with him, you just have to walk up to him and say, woo, 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 Peeps clearly intends to be the leader of the flock. All of which means, what or what can a Canada goose do? The answer is, anything it wants. All right, if you'd like to learn more about our stories, visit the Minnesota Bound podcast, the stories behind the stories. You can find them wherever you get podcasts.
Just a snug fit. Coming up, we help you get started in a sweet spring tradition. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, Ice Castle Fish House and RV, Star Bank, and by Rapala. Maple syrup is a time-honored tradition for many in the Midwest, and if you've ever had the desire to tap a maple tree in your backyard, I'm here at Three Rivers Park District with Mary to show you how to get started. Hi, Mary. Hi, Laura. Welcome to the Sugar Shack. I'm so excited to try this today. Now, is this something that takes a lot of equipment? No, there's just a couple things that you need, and most are pretty easy to find. So, first of all, you'll need a spile or spout that you can um, put into the tree where the sap is gonna drip out. You'll need some kind of drill. We use this brace and bit hand drill. You can also use a power drill. Then you'll need a bucket or a bag, something to collect that sap in. This is an interesting tool, a stick. Ah, this is a knowledge tool. Oh. So this is something that, that we're gonna use so that we know which tree is the right tree to tap. So I'm looking around here, most of us identify maple trees by their leaves. So how do we know which tree is a maple? Our knowledge tool is where it comes in handy. So we can see in this, like where the branches are coming off of here, these two are going off in exactly opposite or the same spot on the branch. So that means it's opposite branching. That's what maples have. So that's a good first clue. The bark can be another good clue. Most or a lot of them have kind of this rough bark. Some call it bacon bark. How do you know it's the right time to tap the maple tree? So springtime is the only time, actually, and very specifically within that, it needs to be freezing at night, or below freezing at night, and above freezing or warm during the day. And that freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing, is what causes the sap to start moving in the tree. Is there a certain spot you should tap the tree? Any height is fine, whatever's comfortable for your body. You do wanna get the drill at slightly up angle and that's just gonna help the sap drip out a little bit easier. And we're gonna drill in about two, two and a half inches, which gets us into the right part of the tree where the sap should be flowing. Is it time for the spile? It's time for the spile. Can you just stick that in there for me? Just a snug fit. All right, so we are going to just tap Gently tap that in so it's nice and snug. Right on the hook. And then we listen. That's the sound of gold right there, liquid gold, isn't it? Beautiful. <laughs> Best spring sound there is. Yes. Sap's looking nice and clear. Looks like a good amount. We can take this back to the sugar shack. The next step is to cook our sap on the evaporator down into syrup. And this looks kind of like a professional setup. What if you're just starting? For someone just starting out, you can do it over the campfire with like a big turkey roasting pan, or if you have a propane stove, you can do it over that. Main things you wanna do is start outside, because a lot of steam is leaving. Yes, I'm getting a facial right now, actually. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> it is nice. And then second thing is you want a lot of surface area so that all that steam can escape. So how do you know when this is ready for the stovetop to start cooking the maple syrup? So this is our fancy uh, cup. We're just gonna scoop up some of the cooked sap in there. And then this is what we call a hydrometer. As it starts to float up, that's a good time where you might be ready to bring it inside. Once you get inside, another couple hours maybe until you're floating right at this little red line. And here we have the final product. Mm, the best part. And if people want to learn more, you guys offer classes here. Yep, we have classes for all ages. Just go check out threeriversparks.org and everything should be on there. All right, Mary, cheers to our hard work today. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Delicious. And here's to enjoying nature's sweet offerings.
Subscribe to our Minnesota Bound YouTube channel. All of our full episodes are there. Still ahead, we warm things up with a pretty fun wax about our sun. But first, we visit a Minnesota State Park home to Minnesota's biggest waterfall. Mm, just look at that. Closed captioning provided by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Up next, we head north to the tippy tip of Minnesota's Arrowhead, literally on the Canadian border, to take a walk in the park. I'm Travis Nowitzki. I'm the park manager here at Grand Portage State Park. We are at the northeast tip of the state. We are as far northeast as you can travel in Minnesota right now without actually going into Canada. It's the only park that is not actually owned by the state. We are on tribal land here owned by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And we have an all native staff here. The Grand Portage name comes from the Grand Portage Trail, which was established by the Ojibwe people before the fur trade. And then the fur trade came in and adopted the use of the trail. And this trail connects Lake Superior to the Pigeon River, which gives access to inland waterways. What the park is most known for is High Falls on the Pigeon River, and that is the tallest waterfall in Minnesota at about 120 feet tall. I loved hearing the water, the, the sound from the waterfall get closer and closer until you could almost feel it, you know, pumping in yourself. This was such a surprise. Hadn't planned on coming here today at all, just sort of looked on the map and said, let's go here. It is a draw. People come because we're right on the border. We try to come up here at least once a month or so, but when I have people visiting, I always make them come here. <laughs> I own my own virtual yoga studio called True Earth Yoga, and so I'll come up here and find a nice spot and meditate for myself, but then also record so that my students can see it too. We have just under five miles of hiking trail in the park. The first half mile of the trail is paved, wheelchair accessible, one of the, just a handful of trails on the North Shore that are like that. This nice paved path, railings along the way when it's a little bit, when there's ramps and stuff, so well thought out. Because without that, we may not have these accessible ways to these scenic wonders. And then there's Middle Falls, which is more of the backcountry hike. <laughs> The hike up to Middle Falls is amazing. There's this really nice vista just about three-fourths of a mile up. You can look out way over Lake Superior or if you tuck back a little bit where you might not think to go, you can look over the hills as well as a little glimpse of Lake Superior. This is more of a rugged backcountry hike with rough rocky terrain, a lot of tree roots, so you really have to watch your footing on that trail. Hiking is our number one activity here. We do get a lot of bird watchers too. Hey, can, you, can you hear the robin? Our trail is known especially for the warblers along the, the half mile paved trail to High Falls. Visitors will come to see the birds migrating through along the High Falls Trail. Um, the Pigeon River is, is a pretty good flyway here. Photography is also very popular. I take a lot of pictures and save about a tenth of them. <laughs> It is a good treasure for the state of Minnesota. Straight ahead, a story about that bright ball way up in the sky. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Cass Lake Chain of Resorts, Hewitt Docks Lifts and Pontoon Legs, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. on its way so you know what that means the sun the sun exactly <laughs> why ron shara went on assignment to better understand that big old bright light in the sky <laughs> um. 
We Minnesotans tend to have a love-hate relationship with the sun. In winter, we seek beaches to worship the sun. In summer, we hide in its shade. When it's dark and overcast for days, we miss those rays. Yet at sunset, we pause to watch them go away. A few Minnesotans relish a new day, the sun morning rise in the sky. As someone once said, every sunrise is a poem written on the earth. Yet other folks at the dawn of a day prefer to have their eyes closed on a pillow. Nature's critters too are touched by the sun in more ways than one. It's been noted, for example, you can't sneak a sunrise past a rooster. The sun might be 93 million miles away, but its impact on all plant and animal life is, well, shall we say, it makes babies. Yes, as the earth tilts toward the sun and the days grow longer, the urge to mate and reproduce intensifies. Wild tom turkeys gobble and strut to attract hens for mating. She also gets in the mood instinctively knowing her eggs need to be fertilized. Migrating sandhill cranes may have thousands of miles to fly, but springtime leads to courtship dances along the way. And who hasn't heard love songs from our feathered friends ringing from the treetops as the days grow longer? Plants may not sing, but plants sense increasing daylight, which triggers flowers to grow and to bloom. The impact of increasing daylight is different for a buck deer. A buck's antlers, his sex appeal, simply come loose and fall to the ground. Interestingly, a buck deer's sex life, known as the rut, is inspired not by longer days, but by decreasing daylight. As the days grow shorter in October and November, a buck's neck swells and his urge to find a receptive doe keeps him on the move. And yes, he has a new set of antlers to show off his buckhood. In truth, the sun guides the life of every plant or animal from tiny flowers to giant moose. Drake mallards are adorned in colorful spring plumage. Black bears get shiny new spring coats. And let's not forget how we learn to use a light bulb to fool chickens. Yes, many a farmer has turned on the lights in the hen house to fool chickens into laying eggs ahead of springtime. So it's no wonder the center of our universe is a star we call the sun. Now you know it does more than make sunburns. Keep in mind, nothing lasts forever. Scientists predict the sun is gonna burn out, go dark, in about five billion years. That's nothing for a rooster to crow about. Natural sunlight is so good for you. Just don't forget the sunscreen. Makes sense to me. <laughs> well, that about does it for us. Laura and I hope to see you back here next week. In the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. To get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook.